turn your phones off or Gavin... Oh, we're live. There we go. Sorry, I was just telling Gavin off because he's got his phone on and he's interrupting the live stream. And we have someone walking across. Welcome to the April... No, May Astro Talk for the ASV. Uh, we're at Mueller Hall tonight. You guys are not. You're watching it live. And tonight we have Bruno Zelke presenting a talk on how the universe came to be. But before we begin, I'd like to say that in the, in the spirit of reconciliation, the ASV would like to, uh, like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. And we pay our respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Before we introduce Bruno, I'd like to say a quick congratulations to the ASV committee uh, who were voted in last night at our AGM and a thank you to uh, the ASV members for their ongoing support for the new committee. Uh, we've got many great projects planned for the society going forward and I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Chris Rudge for his hard work over the last 12 months as uh, the previous president. Now if you're enjoying tonight's yep, <laughs> round of applause for Chris. Chris is not here tonight because he's put himself into isolation because uh, his son has COVID. Um, now, if you're enjoying tonight's stream, you can... Whoa. That wasn't me, I promise. If you're enjoying tonight's stream, on Facebook, you can donate stars. And on YouTube, you can donate stickers. All of the donations, large and small, are welcome. And apologies for the uh, beanie that just got on stream there. Always one troublemaker. Now to introduce our speaker, Bruno, Bruno Zelke. Come on up, Bruno. Bruno studied computer science and applied mathematics at RMIT before working mainly as an IT consultant. He is an experienced speaker who has delivered some 160 lectures. Is that all, just 160? Something like, well, yeah. on the last count. On the subject of cosmology and has presented papers at astronomical conferences and contributes to science forums such as Physics Stack Exchange and the Quora Forum Online. Uh, networking with Australian and international scientists helps keep him up to date. Welcome, Bruno. The floor is yours. I have it on. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, and thank you, uh, Lee, for wiring me up and giving me all the, all the cues. So stand here, don't stand there. <laughs> I turned the microphone over there and that's why you heard the whistle. <laughs> okay. Tonight we're going to talk about how, what caused the Big Bang. Okay. What happened in somewhere that caused our universe to, uh, to come into being. You are probably most um, used to a diagram like that with the, with the Big Bang on one side, which is uh, uh, considered to be the beginning of, um, of the universe. But I'm going to tell you something different today, okay? Uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is something that is uh, promoted in uh, in popular literature and on videos, but it's not quite right. So with that uh, ado, let's move on. Um, also, as a as a preamble, I should I should say that um, because I'm speaking to astronomers, you most likely have inherited an attitude that if it cannot be proven experimentally, then it is most likely fantasy or some kind of fable. Well, physicists divide roughly into experimentalists who either by way of conducting experiments find something new and then they build a theory out of it, or they take someone else's theory and then uh, prove by experiments, multiple experiments, that that actually works. Uh, quite often this is done by uh, computer models and, uh, and, and real experiments in, in physical sense. Um, on the other hand, we have the theoreticians. Now, they are the guys that dream up all kinds of ideas, they, most of it in incomprehensible <laughs> mathematics, and then they build computer models and 
vary a number of different variables like pressure, temperature, um, all kinds of uh, physical constants and see how the model responds to that and how it behaves. And if the model um, predicts uh, results which can be, which have been measured by experiment, then the model is, is considered to be a live one worth pursuing. Now, there was a, a famous physicist by name of uh, Steven Weinberg, Nobel Prize winner. Many of his students won Nobel Prizes themselves. He is considered as a, as a physicist, physicist, a father of physicists. And he took this attitude that no matter how outlandish an idea, it ought to be taken seriously because sooner or later someone else will consider it and, and make, make good with it. So he said that. He says, we do not take them seriously enough. I thought I'd mention that because I'm, I'm an exalted company of experimentalists here. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> this is what we're going to talk about. The universe started here. The Big Bang started there. Okay? What we have here is a fluctuation in the primordial vacuum. Um, I should mention also that we're not going to go into, into any physics of it today. Um, I'm just sort of skipping on top of the stones, as it were, headlines only, to, to keep it nice and simple. And then um, space expanded and then expanded very fast. And this is the period. This is the period which is, uh, uh, I'll list the numbers for you in a moment, during which the space expanded and then um, cooled. The universe cooled. And as it was cooling, it delivered the conditions during the Big Bang actually occurred. OK, so many of the ideas we're going to talk about today, you can quietly regard as uh, fantasy if you like. But uh, physicists are, are taking them quite seriously. They are, they are models which are untestable in, uh, in real sense, in a physical sense. But they are based on some good reason and logic and, and, and uh, some informed um, concept. So we're going to, in essence, we're going to look at the conditions before. <coughs> First, I need to <coughs> get some definitions across. Um, we very loosely use the concept of universe. So what do we mean by the word universe? It's <laughs> It's been defined as universe is all that there is. Now, what does that mean? Now, I've got a, an image over here. <clears throat> this is the universe, all that there is. And then there's our universe, the larger portion of the, of the black circle. And then there's an observable universe, which is the part that we can see. Um, as you probably know, it is limited by the, by the speed of the, uh, the light, um, which takes so long to get from there to there. What actually happens here is that every day, that wide band, uh, well, the, the, the matter and energy within, within that white uh, circle is actually expanding, and it's crossing that, what I would call, event horizon. And as it does, the stars and whatever it is behind that line, behind the event horizon, become invisible to us. So essentially, the radius of the observable universe is constant, while the rest of the un our universe, and I use the word our universe advisedly, and because the, the all there is universe uh, contains multiple universes like that. We call it multiverse. This is according to, to the multiverse model. And I'm going to explain that in detail. Now, the size of that, as you know, from here to there, light would need to travel for 46 billion years. This is the radius of our observable universe. How did we work that out? Because when the universe was much, much smaller, 
and those photons which we now observe coming back to us, which are called the, the uh, um, cosmic microwave background radiation, um, those photons were created at 380,000 years uh, after the Big Bang, and, and they still exist. If, if you are old enough, uh, like me, you can remember the, the old television. If you tuned it to the off station, you could see white patterns, white dots going on. 1% of that comes from the cosmic background radiation, microwave radiation. So, um, how do we know this distance? Because they've calculated the how much the waveform of that light has stretched and it stretched 1100 times physicists call it the uh, gravitational redshift so multiplied by a thousand the universe at that uh, time was was uh, 46 million light years across so 1100 times it's about 46 billion or thereabouts so that's um, that's where we're at right now the the all there is universe is estimated at 150 followed by 23 zeros. Um, I can't imagine numbers like that. Okay. So, um, physicists divide the the different kind of uh, models into into classifications that are different to the ones that I've chosen here. Essentially, I've got. Uh, um, three or four different ones. One isn't listed here. Uh, the, the steady state, we have inflationary models, and we have cyclic models, of which there are several. And there's also one, one which I forgot to put on the, on the slide. It talks about uh, us living in a computer simulation. You might think that's a joke. Some take it seriously. Okay, so this is the agenda for, for tonight. Okay, let's talk about steady state. <clears throat> um, I did by religion and social mores and uh, tradition. Until about the beginning of 20th century, most people, including people like Einstein, believed that universe always was and it was unchanging. It was the same forever. Now, along comes a, a, a guy like, uh, like Hubble, and his uh, Mount Wilson uh, Observatory, and he noticed that the further uh, lying stars are receding from us faster than the ones closer. And from that, he concluded that the universe is expanding. And he established what is known as a Hubble constant, which became uh, uh, a subject of much controversy just recently. Okay. So, that was the idea before Hubble. Now, along comes Hubble and uh, Hoyle, who was the uh, proponent of that, uh, of that theory, mathematically and every other way, he now had to cope with the concept of the expansion. So, what he was saying is that, okay, the universe has so much stuff in it, okay, energy and matter and whatever form, and as it is expanding, it is diluting. Let's just say that there is a certain amount of air in this room, and let's now say that that, that room has expanded 1,000 times, and there was now more air added to it. Most of us would choke. This is the, the, this is the concept I want to convey, that as the universe is expanding, the, the amount of energy, the density of, of energy and matter in the universe is diluted. But, but uh, Hoyle said, no, 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 no. As space is being uh, uh, created, more matter and more um, energy is being created to keep the density constant. And, and this is, this is uh, what he called the, uh, the steady state universe. I, I think he had a name for it, like steady state field theory or something like that. Okay, that's all we need to say about that. Oh yes, of course, um, as soon as um, um, Hubble proved that the universe is expanding, um, 
that, that posed a serious quandary. If the universe is bigger today than it was yesterday, then it must have been very small a way, way back. Therefore, it was not always, it was not unchanging. Okay? So that was another, another blow. Nevertheless, the modern theories um, have almost exactly the same problem we have something called dark energy. Now Einstein had a problem with his mathematics. His math was saying that the, the universe cannot be stable. If you put a pencil like, uh, like pen like that and let go, it'll fall one way or another. It's the same thing with, with the energy and, and what we call the quantum state in the universe. It is con continuously fluctuating and unstable. So to say that um, it is uh, forever unchanging is, is nonsense because sooner or later within very small fraction of a second something will happen and it will either start contracting or, or expanding and uh, so Einstein introduced what he, what he called the cosmological constant in his equation to stop it from expanding. Of course, after Hubble invited him to, to look through the telescope, he, he called it the biggest blunder of his life. Anyway, that's, that's the legend. Um, but today, we have exactly the same problem. Um, a descendant of, of the cosmological constant, and there are several names for it. You can call it a negative energy, negative gravity, you can call it dark energy, whatever it is, it's, it's causing the universe to expand. Imagine that you're blowing up a balloon, the pressure on the skin of the balloon is from the inside. And this is the concept of negative energy, because gravity is trying to compress everything together. So we talk about negative energy, negative gravity, we talk about dark energy. They're, they're, to some degree they are interchangeable terms. Now, where does that dark energy come from? As the uh, space is expanding, physicists say that the dark energy is a property of space. More space, more dark energy. So you can see it's a runaway train an exponential expansion. Now that is in fact what might happen. Unless, of course, there is some mechanism where that dark energy will get, so to speak, tired of expanding and it will slow down. And we have three scenarios for the end of the universe. One, where it will get tired and, and everything will stop. We call it the heat death. And if, if it keeps on expanding forever, we call it the big rip. Not only stars will get ripped apart and planets and all matter down to subatomic particles and then subatomic particles will get ripped up uh, to, to just energy slowly vibrating at near, near absolute zero temperature. Pretty depressing, isn't it? So all the stuff that we dreamed up, all the poetry, all the sculptures, all the buildings we built, it's all for nothing. <laughs> You can go and tell your children that, give up. <laughs> it's all for nothing. So the dark energy is, is presenting us with a, with a problem. Where does the energy come from? It could be coming from the original impetus of the, uh, of the inflation energy, but that spent itself a long time ago. Or maybe it is being drawn from outside of our universe, from the primordial uh, vacuum, just like it did during the, the first micro, microseconds of, of uh, inflation. Nobody knows. I'll move on from that. Okay, let's move back to 19th century. A fellow by the name of uh, Ludwig Boltzmann um, has proposed a mathematical um, version of the, or statistical version of the second law of thermodynamics. You probably know that the, the three laws of thermodynamics have been proposed much, much earlier. Uh, eventually, a, a, a well-known mathematician by the name of Cantor in the 19th century has, has put some kind of a mathematical structure to that. So Boltzmann didn't invent the, the, the three laws, but he did propose a statistical law, um, S equals chi log to the base of 10. 
and that's actually engraved on his uh, tombstone. Well, he had a clever idea. He said, okay, imagine that you are in a boat. I need to give you a, a dynamic picture, a, a video if you wish. You're in a boat and there are huge waves, not waves, rolling waves, but, but mountains of water going up and down like that and your boat is going with it. You get the picture. And all of a sudden, it's quiet. Okay, You're in the eye of the storm. And Boltzmann proposed that this is the ideal condition in which when a huge quantum fluctuation occurs in the vacuum energy, in the primordial vacuum, remember our universe doesn't exist yet, um, then this is the area in which it will have the greatest impact. And string theorists produce this, this map, um, a suggestion, they call it the landscape the probability landscape. The most probable place where, where, such a, uh, where a new universe may occur is where the energy is at a very low level. And Boltzmann suggested this is where the um, lowest level of entropy, one of the basic conditions for, for Big Bang to occur, is, is low entropy. Entropy means, in a strict language, means disorder. Disorder means this. Um, let's say that you all get up off your chairs and you start walking in every possible decision, uh, direction. Or um, the, the air molecules in this room are, are bouncing off each other and they're banging about in the walls. Th this is called symmetry. Physicists call it symmetry because there's no preferred direction. In every direction it's exactly the same. However, once you start blowing a vacuum cleaner or a, or a strong air jet, then we have a direction, a force, that becomes a vector. Um, this is necessary to understand, that, but in, in, in the low areas where, where the donuts are, uh, the string theory suggested, uh, following Boltzmann, that uh, this is the ideal condition, in fact necessary condition, for any Big Bang to occur. Okay. So, fast forwarding to the end of the uh, 20th century, along comes um, Alan Guth, a postdoc in, in physics, and uh, he was studying the idea of homogeneity of the universe. What I mean by that is that um, it's been measured and proven by astronomers that the density of matter and energy in the universe is fairly uniformly spread. Um, fair enough, we have galaxies and then we have voids, uh, empty spaces, but, but when you take the statistical averaging effect, it is pretty much average um, in terms of density. And this is known as the homogeneity problem. Now, Cosmologists couldn't understand why that is so. Why is it so, so nice? So Guth came up with an idea that there must have been some kind of a fast expansion event of space. And because of that, everything was stretched the same amount. And he came up with an idea of hyperinflation. Okay. Um, his, his model included um, an inflaton field causing inflation, very imaginative, in a, in a slowly changing field, just like those quiet waves I told you about. And he suggested that a number of uh, fluctuations may have occurred in, in that field, and as a result of that, several regions, which he called bubbles, started uh, expanding because they were imbued with this additional energy and they started expanding at the speed of light. Why at the speed of light? Einstein's uh, general relativity, in fact special relativity, says that nothing in, in space can travel faster than the speed of light. Okay? But space itself and the field in it can expand a lot faster. There's no, no limitation. So here's what happens. He suggested at first that 
the, the regions which were imbued with energy by, by these fluctuations um, became fast expanding bubbles and these bubbles were meant to crash into each other and deliver the, the energy of the Big Bang. But the calculations which, which followed showed that that is not possible because space was expanding faster than the bubbles themselves. Nevertheless, um, uh, they did work out that the expansion, uh, remember I showed you the, the hyperinflation going like that, it, um, it inflated by that factor. If, if you call the initial volume of the universe, and that is trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth the size of the speck of dust, okay? And it expanded by 10 followed by 20 i zeros behind it in size, and by then, one second later, um, it was meant to have a volume of about an orange, okay? That expansion, that hyperinflation, was, was meant to happen between 1 over 36 zeros of a second up to 1 over 32 zeros of a second from time zero, from that, from that initial fluctuation. The bubbles were meant to collide and release the Big Bang energy. That was his model, which is known as the hyperinflation model. Okay, that was the first sensible model proposed. Now, these people, Steinhardt and Albrecht in the USA and Starobinsky and uh, um, Linde in the Moscow University, they did some of their own calculations and they said it is not possible and mathematically they proved that that, that model cannot possibly work. It does not deliver the Big Bang as we know it. So essentially, the Guth model failed. Okay, so what did they do then? <laughs> they slowed the inflation down. <laughs> now you might say, is that fitting the theory to the facts or, or the facts to the theory? <laughs> A lot of twiddling going on. <clears throat> Nevertheless, let's consider it. Here we have what the, the physicists called a scalar field. The scalar means expanding in the same, in every direction at the same rate. It's sort of like a, a grenade going off. The, the shock wave travels in every direction in the same way. On the other hand, if you fire a rifle, then the bullet goes one way and that becomes a vector. And it's very directional. Now, <clears throat> what have we got here? This signifies the energy density of the primordial vacuum and it was considered to be sitting in a higher level um, in the locality of the region than the global level. Sort of like I'm standing on a podium here, I'm a little bit higher than the floor, okay? And that physicists call the false uh, vacuum energy level. In order to get down to that, something must happen, okay? And, uh, and this something is called um, uh, tunneling. I won't go through the physics of it right now, but enough, enough said that the expansion which followed that is slower than indicated here. It is still extremely fast. I mean, if, if I wanted to indicate how fast that actually expanded, it, that'd be just two straight lines. Boom. I mean, how do you show the difference between 1 over 36 zeros to 1 over 32 zeros? It's, it's incomprehensible. So, um, in terms of a graphical representation, it doesn't really show that it's actually slower. They also considered that they only needed one space bubble per universe to expand. And this is shown over here. That bubble is expanding um, at the speed of light and slowly the, the energy of that is coalescing into, into photons, gamma rays. You probably know that the uh, visible spectrum of, of light is just a tiny sliver on the, on the range 
to your left you will have uh, ultraviolet and then going all the way to gamma rays which are which are very very energetic and high high frequency and to your right they would be uh, microwaves and then radio waves which are which are very long waves okay so that actually worked in terms of logic the space expanded at the same rate as the bubble so they were together they worked together and they preserved the homogeneity concept so Guth was very happy with that yeah and then of course um, the, the Big Bang starts here releases the energy uh, into radiation and massless particles I will go through that in a moment we're not at the Big Bang yet okay now <coughs> Starobinsky and people like that considered that inflation didn't stop there. It, it, it was produced chaotically, meaning without any apparent reason why it should happen here, there, and when, whenever. Um, and it happened eternally. So we have two more models, chaotic cosmic um, expansion and eternal of course generating new universes with different kinds of properties if the gravity was too high in one universe it would collapse into a black hole an absolutely minuscule black hole and instantly evaporate um, if they didn't have enough gravity then galaxies wouldn't form there would be no chemistry no life at all okay so of um, it it turns out that the larger ones uh, apparently survive better than the smaller ones. And this is the concept of, of the multiverse model. Um, I have a little poem here for you, written by Percy Biss Shelley. Now, how would you have a name like, have a name like Biss? What's your name, sir? Uh, Biss. <laughs> I just spell it. <laughs> um, okay, lots of people have difficulty with my first name. Um, this is the same Shelley that was married to uh, the Shelley who wrote the uh, Frankenstein book for your information he also wrote the uh, Ozymandias Kings look upon my works and tremble he said <laughs> okay he wrote worlds and worlds are rolling ever from creation to decay like the bubbles on a river sparkling bursting born away beautiful isn't it? so imagine yourself standing before a two-foot waterfall <clears throat> water comes down the waterfall and produces little bubbles the bubbles sparkle away and they burst that's our universes one of them is ours okay. impermanent okay so here's a summary of the mainstream inflationary models I should say that um, this new inflation, the slow inflation introduced by, uh, mainly by Linde, is still taught in universities as, as a standard model of cosmology. Not because we can prove it, but because there is no one that satisfies most of the conditions that, that uh, are required to produce the Big Bang. There is another one which I will mention shortly that comes close. And then, of course, we, we, we've relegated the, uh, the Guthys model to old inflation, <laughs> replaced it with new, and then there's the chaotic, eternal, and the multiverse. The word multiverse was first mentioned by a fellow by name to Nemo. Why before that? Okay, I want to talk a little bit about Big Bang. This is a subject of a, an hour and a half lecture, so I've condensed it to three slides. Here we have the uh, the uh, huge inflation um, and at the end of that inflation at 10 to the minus 32 the minus means 1 over 10 or oh, 1 over 32 10 to the followed by 32 zeros um, after the the uh, time zero the energy of that expanding inflaton field dissipates into high energy photons this is where Big Bang begins okay there was uh, you will see pictures in popular flash and in videos which huge flash and and lots of energy and all that yes there was a lots of a lot of energy 
but it happened in such a minuscule volume, it was more of a foot. In, in total darkness, in total silence, there was no Big Bang. As such, it's just that such humongous amount of energy are involved. Um, I have here, <coughs> uh, this is what the photons look like. They're, they're in perfect symmetry according to uh, the physical, uh, the physicist's uh, concept of symmetry because there's no preferred direction. Uh, uh, Lindae calculated that that energy is uniform, symmetric, and densely concentrated. If you, if you weigh that energy, because mass and energy are equivalent according to Einstein, um, if you weigh that energy on Earth, it would be 10 followed by 98 zeros kilograms in every cubic centimeter. That's like, like your little fingernail. It's incomprehensible. Okay, so by now, a universe is the size of orange. It's starting to cool rapidly, like that. The expansion slows down as the inflaton energy is dissipating and converting into photons and, and whatever. The entropy order is at its lowest level ever at that point and increasing. Okay? And then what happens? Right. This is the beginning of the Big Bang here. Um, I didn't in indicate the time scales because they were wrong. Um, the first thing that departs, the first force field that departs from the what's known as theory of everything, known as tau, is gravity. Um, string theorists, uh, you probably know, that they require at least 10, possibly 11 dimensions to make their theory work. What it means is they have the three dimensions for for space, one for time, and six hidden dimensions. Now what do they mean by that? Imagine that you're looking through a window and you see a, a power cable um, outside of the window. As far as you are concerned, it, it's a two-dimensional line. But if you had a telescope or a, a telephoto lens, you could see that that line is actually made up of multiple strands twist it together, and along one of those strands, there's an ant walking. That's a different dimension. So these dimensions are hidden from us, and that's what the string theorists call them, hidden dimensions. Um, gravity apparently lives in the fifth dimension, and when it comes into the four-dimensional world, like ours, it becomes very weak. Okay. Um, how weak? I haven't got a whiteboard here. But the strong nuclear force, which has something called gluons holding, holding quarks and, and, and other parts of the interior of a nucleus together, that strong nuclear force is considered at level one. Okay? And then we have weak nuclear force, which is used for transformation from one particle into another and in radioactive decay. That weak nuclear force is one hundredth of the strength of that strong nuclear force. Electromagnetic force is only one ten thousandth of that. And gravity is one over thirty-eight zeros of that, of that one. That's why gravity is such a weak force. But it's additive over distances. So gravity departs straight away, and now that creates <coughs> a gut point known as grand unified theory. Um, you have to appreciate that because we live some, somewhere here, we are looking backwards in time. So we experience this, and looking backwards, we find that at that point, all these, all these uh, three here were unified. So we called it the grand unified theory, and this one is called the theory of everything. In, uh, none of this has been actually proven. Okay, so um, a little bit later, and I'm, I'm talking like 1 over 20 zeros time, after, the, after, after time zero, um, the strong force, the strong nuclear force departs, and shortly after that, electroweak force divides into electromagnetic and weak force. So from then on, we have normal conditions in the Big Bang. Uh, by then, 
the temperature has dropped considerably and we have a number of things happening. I also forgot to mention that, that about here Higgs field comes in. The Higgs field, as you know, has been uh, recently ratified. Uh, Peter Higgs uh, working in one group of scientists and there were two other groups way back in the 1963-64. They suggested that there must be some kind of field with which all these massless particles um, created early in the Big Bang interact and that's how they acquire mass. Now I'll take you to the beach for a moment, up to your knees in water. And now you're walking through and you're wading through it and you find it more difficult than walking on sand. The, the larger you are, the thicker your legs, shall we say, the more difficult you're finding walking through that water. The more massive the particle, the more resistance it feels, shall we say, I use the word loosely, going through the through the um, Higgs field. It, it is not actually like that at all. They interact, they change into other particles, they flip back again. It's, it's, this is another one and a half hour lecture. But let's just say that you're walking through a field of molasses and you're feeling that kind of resistance. <laughs> that analogy is probably good enough. So Higgs field comes into, into um, existence uh, over here and as you will know um, um, it was the Higgs field uh, particle, the boson, Higgs field boson, was actually proven to exist in, in 2012 and, uh, and Peter Higgs and, and Engelbert got the Nobel Prize for it. Okay. Am I going too slow, too fast? All good. Okay. Here's a pictorial uh, representation of the Big Bang. There's the fluctuation. I actually blanked out the, uh, the, the bright shiny bit because I find, found it un, untrue. There's the, the slow expansion at first and then faster. And here we have the energy of the, the Big Bang or uh, of the infraton field being converted into photons, the gamma photons and, and, and massless particles and then the massless particles acquire mass by interaction with the, with the Higgs field and there and then we have quarks and leptons um, and we have gluons and all kinds of uh, zoo of, of uh, particle animals and the gluons manage to capture quarks and form nuclei. This is the first time that the nucleus is produced and then uh, through interactions between and between those, the nuclei, which the physicists call hadrons, uh, and they were nuclei of hydrogen and helium, with a tiny little bit of lithium and a smidgen of beryllium. That's all the time the Big Bang had to produce uh, particles, because it expanded so fast and cooled down and there wasn't enough temperature to, to create anything more complex. More complex uh, Particles are created in the cores of stars during supernova and, and such. And um, okay, so now we have um, this. This one here has two neutrons and two protons. That that's obviously helium. And there there is um, deuterium, and there's uh, um, hydrogen. So now we have we have um, nuclei not atoms yet, just the nucleus of, of these um, elements. And 380,000 years later, uh, because this is about three minutes after time zero, so add 380,000 years later, um, the, uh, the nuclei attract electrons, freely floating electrons, and as the electrons are attracted to the nucleus, they are captured by it and they give up extra energy. Something really unusual happens at that point. At that point, they give up the extra energy in a form of a photon. And that photon is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is the photon that is still coming to us from the event horizon of our observable universe. Okay. After that, uh, 100,000 
years pass of uh, dark ages where nothing much happens except humongous clouds of gas and, and helium. And when I say humongous, I mean thousand times larger than our galaxy. This, this is the size we are talking about. So these, uh, these clouds are, are slowly condensing under their own gravity and, uh, and they, here and there they will be a little bit more more gas than there, so just like rivulets going down the hill, they, they combine and produce bigger bigger streams. In the same way, gravity attracts uh, matter to where the matter already is denser. So rich gets richer and poor gets poorer, so to speak. This is the way of nature. So um, what happens then is that uh, oh yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, the Big Bang also created something dark matter. We don't know what the dark matter is, but we know its characteristics and we know how it behaves. In the same way that the ancient Greeks didn't know what the wind was, what air was made of, but they could see that it bent trees, they made ripples on, on water, they knew what it does, what effect it has, in the same way we now know what dark matter actually does, but we don't know what it is made of, what, what, consti what constitutes, what particles uh, make it up. So, um, one thing that dark matter does, it weakly interacts with gravity. Now there's five times as much dark matter in the universe as there is ordinary matter. And that means wherever there is matter, dark matter surrounds it, uh, five times as much of it, and the gravity of the combined two is compressing the, the gas inside. So the galaxies are now starting to compress a little bit unevenly, here a bit more, there a bit more, and eventually and the one end may be a bit heavier than the other, a bit more dense, and they, it starts rotating. Once uh, a cloud of gas starts rotating, it flattens. Just like you put something on a lazy Susie uh, fluid or something and you start rotating, it'll start to spread. Um, biker's dough or, or, or honey or whatever. So. Dark matter is to some degree responsible for formation of uh, galaxies and the and, uh, beginning of, uh, of stars. So that's what happens here. We have stars, we have galaxies, and from then on it's just straightforward astronomy up to 13.8 billion plus or minus 100 million years where we are now. That was the Big Bang. Okay, let me now go on to the uh, cyclic models. Um, they are very interesting actually. Way back um, three and a half thousand years ago, 1500 years before current era, um, the Hindu philosophers um, wrote in their, what they call, Raga Vedas. Raga is a, is a story, Veda is a visualization. And uh, they described um, a sausage-like cycle of, of our universe. They thought that it came into existence, existed for a while, contracted, and then another sausage started and it went like that, bang, bang, bang. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. We also have um, multi-dimensional universes crashing each other, known as ekpyrotic. The word ekpyrotic in Greek means conflagration of fire, meaning things coming together to, to, uh, to emit energy. Uh, Curie over at Steinhardt and Turok thought of that. Um, Turok wrote actually a book called The uh, Universe from Nothing. Um, some considered that uh, we are the descendant of a previous universe, and then Roger Penrose uh, dreamed up a, something called conformal cyclic cosmology model. I'll mention that in a moment. So that's, that's the agenda for the cyclic models. Okay, so here we have the sausages following one another. And uh, mathematicians calculated that to make the jump from, the, from one cycle to another, um, would cause entropy and disorder to increase very rapidly. 
and that meant that to create another universe you would have to compensate for that and inject more and more energy into it and it, it just became unworkable it, physicists and mathematicians are very scared of infinities once they start seeing infinities in their equations they say something must be wrong here <laughs> and that's exactly what happened here you can imagine this going up like that This is an interesting one. This is a serious contender to be, a, to be a realistic, except for one flaw, which I'll mention. String theories say that in space there exist humongous membranes. Okay? I mean, really large. They exist in fifth dimension and they are very close to one another. Now, every hundred trillion years or thereabouts, they, they come together. In a, in a cycle like that and as they come together they heat each other up and they, they cause something like the Big Bang. Okay? We don't really know what the Big Bang was but something like the Big Bang is, has obviously occurred. So uh, um, th that is what happens here. Um, I should also mention that uh, the um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. Okay, so these two membranes, brains for short, uh, they come together, they heat each other up, Big Bang occurs, and then we go through the, the cycles of the stages of the Big Bang, as I explained, and then we have eventually they 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 part the company and cool down, and we have stars and galaxies like we have today. And eventually all the stars die out and, uh, and everything gets converted back to uh, cold fluctuating energy um, in some hundred trillion years ago or thereabouts and, um, and then they do it again in a, in a cycle like that. So it's, it's a periodic uh, cyclic sort of uh, manner um, where where the membranes uh, do that. Now, the only one flaw is it that these membranes need to be almost perfectly parallel in order to do that. If they are like 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 that, then the conflagration only happens at at one point. Obviously, not not enough. So that's one of the major objections to that. But otherwise, it answers every tick. Every question that, that has been put to it, it, um, it qualifies. The rebound is interesting. A um, fellow by the name of uh, Bodgewald, uh, just recently, studied, um, well, using uh, Einstein's relativity and the string theory based loop quantum gravity. Let, let me explain this a little bit. The membranes which I've mentioned in string theory apparently have two two strings attached to it. One is attached at one end and the other end is uh, floating freely and the way they vibrate determines their physical characteristics, what kind of particle they become. You mustn't think of particles as golf balls. They really are fluctuations in the field like, like that. And uh, um, so loop uh, loop quantum gravity is a name of a theory for the holy grail of, uh, of, of quantum gravity. Uh, you probably know that the relativity theory of Einstein's and the quantum mechanics, also known as quantum physics, cannot be reconciled and the major sticking points are time and entropy. The, the, it cannot be explained. One of them uh, the quantum version treats time as non-existent, as emergent, um, and uh, space doesn't exist. It's also an emergent quantity, whereas t you'll find it very difficult to accept that because we think we still think in Newtonian terms. Objects are in space, right? I am standing here, and there's space between the podium, and there's, that space exists. But quantum physicists say, no, no, no such thing. The, the concept of space emerges by relationship of distance between the two. Well, I'll let you ponder about that. The same thing 
the same thing with time, but we won't for worry about that. Now, Borgiewold said that there existed a universe before, and as it uh, came to the end of its life, uh, all of the all of the uh, uh, energy particles, which are essentially photons, uh, they actually compressed together. And the reason why they can do that because they are bosons. They on a you know the old story about how many angels you can you can fit on a on a head of the pin. Well, squillions of them. Bosons are very happy to live together, whereas quarks and leptons cannot. They, they, they cannot live together. So at the end of uh, life of a, of a universe, all these uh, photons come together, and the, the, the closer they come together, the more pressure they create, more, uh, more re reproducing the the conditions in which a Big Bang can occur. Um, in, in terms of quantum language, you can, you can only, only squeeze space to a certain level. It's called the Planck level, Planck volume. Planck was a physicist in 1900 who studied uh, black body radiation and he determined certain uh, constants. So once, once you get to a certain, certain level of compression, now more compression can occur and then an explosion occurs, okay? Now, Big Bang is not an explosion in space, it's an expansion of space. So, you mustn't use that term. So, um, Borgiewald suggested that, um, that concept, and he says that not everything in the previous universe translated well into ours. He called it cosmic forgetfulness. But, uh, but mo mo you know, a bit of poetry there. Hawking liked that idea. He, he strongly opposed the idea of multiverse. He said it was nonsense. But then again, Hawking, <laughs> he, had this, uh, he had this attitude, personality quirk, that he would like to poke a stick into an ant's nest of, of the accepted uh, theories and say, that can't be right, you know? Even though everybody believed that was right. But because he was Hawking, everybody was, would start investigating that. And as a result of that, they came up with some really s uh, significant solutions and, and uh, progress in physics. So there was wisdom in, in his being a, a naughty boy, so to speak. Okay. Now we come to Roger Penrose now. I tried to read his books and halfway through I started scratching my head and saying, I don't know where I'm going with this. But um, the simple explanation of, of his model says that when, when all the stars have burned out and, and all matter is ripped apart to basic energy level uh, um, in almost zero temperature and in total darkness and almost nothing moves except the quantum particles, the, the, the uh, uh, energy particles are slowly fluctuating, a new fluctuation will occur, okay? Just like we did before. And, and a new universe comes out of that. See, this, this universe is expanding like ours, and when it comes to, to this uh, situation here, it, uh, it looks like the end of the story. But then a new fluctuation occurs, and so this, the cycle repeats itself. And he often pictures it like, like a bamboo with, with markings on it, crossovers. Okay, now here's a good one. We live in a simulation on a computer. <clears throat> At first it was considered a, a, a joke, but uh, people like uh, Max Taggart and, and uh, some of his followers, they actually took it very seriously. I've read the book and there was some sense in it. Essentially, it says that um, some super-intelligent beings um, which, were, which lived before our universe have such a high level of uh, knowledge and technology that they are able to simulate our universe on what we would call a computer. Now, it is commonly agreed now that our universe is regarded as an information processor. Okay? I'll just let that sink in for a bit because it's a difficult thing to accept. Everything that happens produces or absorbs information. And, and the theorists that follow this information theory, this cosmic information theory, say that um, 
our universe bound by the event horizon um, is actually a processor and these people are saying that it's actually a simulated processor so you and I and everything you see is a simulated object in a computer comes Friday night they forgot to turn the computer off and we're still alive comes Monday morning oh that one didn't work push the delete button <laughs> good one isn't it However, it was disproved as impossible in 2019 because it would consume more energy than it's available in the entire universe. However, some clever uh, programmers came up, computer programmers came up and said, no, 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 that's, that's not right. In the same way that in Mendelbrot um, uh, pattern generation, you need very little information which it repeats itself and it creates new patterns. How many are familiar with Mandelbrot pattern? Mandelbrot pattern, thank you, okay. Educated audience. So, in the same way, a very small amount of information produces huge repeating patterns. And the programmer said that very little programs, a very little amount of information in programs can actually be used to repeat themselves and, and, and produce things. So maybe the idea isn't dead altogether. However, at the moment it stands as a bit of a joke. So, in summary, we talked about steady state universe <coughs> where energy and matter were created by space to keep the density of the expanding universe the same. A universe from nothing, uh, which was created from tiniest speck of, uh, of energy uh, of volume rather, containing unbelievable amount of energy from pre-existing vacuum um, um, and it was based on fast and then slow inflation. It happened chaotically, it happened eternally, it produced many different universes. Uh, oscillating states such as uh, cyclic, repeat, have uh, cyclic repetitions, colliding brines known as the ekpyrotic model, we have rebound states. Um, the physicists don't talk about universes, they talk about quantum states, hence the word states. Um, and then we have multiverse, of course, and then we have Penrose's conformal cyclic and the universe simulated on a computer. And I'll quit on that. Thank you. Now, if I haven't confused anybody, I'm happy to answer some questions. We've got some YouTube questions. Bear with me. See if technology works. Come on, technology, work. Work ads, technology. Ads, ads on YouTube. That's my fault, sorry. Oh my goodness, it's not doing what I want it to do. Here we go, we'll try that again. Here we go, all right. So Emma Pasquale would like to know, she'd be interested to know, to know if you think the Big Bang was caused by aliens from another universe. Could the Big Bang be them trying to speak to us? Oh, God. There's been some, dis <laughs> there's been some heated discussion on YouTube about it. I'll yes, tell you that I, now. I can imagine that. Um, this reminds me of the Flatlanders in the, in the United States. Um, I, I read science fiction, but, uh, but I prefer to answer questions about physics, so I'll let that one pass. <laughs> okay. What role did dark matter have in the expansion of the early universe? Actually, none whatsoever. Um, dark matter is made of matter. Whatever it is that it is, it is actually matter. And matter is governed by gravity, so it causes contraction rather than expansion. It is dark energy that is causing the expansion. Oh, we have another big... Oh my gosh, this one's big. It's too many words for me. Hubble's law, also known as the Hubble limit... Oh, I can't say that one. Lemaitre law? Lemaitre. Yeah. Lemaitre law is the observation in physical cosmology that galaxies are moving away from Earth at speeds proportional to their distance. In other words, the farther they are, the faster they are moving away from Earth. However, when we observe increasingly distant galaxies, aren't they increasingly older? Therefore, wouldn't it be true to say that the older the galaxy, the faster it is moving away? Right. 
Um, there do, we was a, do we get that? Yes, I understand that. There was a model. She's asked several questions here. There's no, a this different person. Sorry? Different person. No, no, I mean, within one question, oh, she asks several like 40 questions. 40 so. questions in there. No. <laughs> what I'm saying, it has several levels. Uh, there's a model uh, known L, M, B, D, W, something, and uh, one of them is the name of Lemaitre and the other one is Walker and, and I forget the name of the other people. Friedman, thank you to my educated friends. Um, what they are saying there, oh, okay, let me go back to, to Hubble. You, I mentioned that Hubble observed that the further outlying uh, stars are receding from us faster than the ones that, were, that are closer. Now, what actually happens is that the entire universe is expanding at the same rate. But imagine a volume just around Earth, well, let's say our galaxies and so on, um, it's expanding, let's say, at 10%. And now imagine this volume expanding at 10%. So 10% of this is about this much, and 10% of that much is about this much. So a star, which is here has expanded that much, and the star which is here is expanded that much. They expanded at the same rate, okay? But in the same way that dots on a balloon will expand faster than dots on a smaller balloon, okay, from one another, um, this gave uh, Hubble the idea of the Hubble, what is now known as the Hubble constant. It was somewhere close to um, 68 something, and now it's being proposed as 74, possibly up to up to 77 or something like that. If you watched uh, the life of Brian, you probably will have learned that the answer to uh, to life is 42. Well, that's wrong. It's actually 74. Okay, that's Hubble constant. Thank you. Now, I was going to say, do we have any questions in the crowd? And we do. We have a young man who's eagerly thrown his hand up. Uh, thank you. Uh, King Griffiths here. Um, my, my knowledge is derived from uh, popularizers, but uh, I, I've got two questions that I, I, I think are the same question. One is that you're, you've um, shown us a, a range of, of, of models uh, answering um, the, the deepest cosmological questions. Um, as though they're equal, or they've pointed out flaws, but I'm, I'm led to believe uh, that uh, the, the Big Bang is well uh, confirmed these days and is accepted as, as, as the one we're going with. And second, um, what about general relativity, as far as we understand it, and most of us don't because we're not uh, at that level in maths. Um, you've given us the diagram that shows us how time is bent, but all along, the ordinary uh, person in the street is, is thinking in a sequential sense. What if time began in the Big Bang? Uh, and this is just incomprehensible, and so we just have to stop the questioning and, and, and just look at what uh, we see in, 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 in um, the receding universe that, okay. that you've described. Remind me of your first question. <laughs> I'm a senior. I have senior moments. <laughs> what was your first question? Oh, that, that there's consensus about uh, the Big Bang. All oh, right, being... right, okay. <clears throat> um, the concept of the Big Bang is, is actually um, much mis misunderstood. Uh, I'll, talk, I'll deal with the time factor later. Um, whatever it is that we call the Big Bang is the beginning of the energy converting into photons and then into matter. This is, this is an agreed, uh, shall we say, convention, okay? Now, some people say that there is no actual proof that uh, Big Bang ever happened. Well, there is. Um, there were three different satellites. Uh, the most recent one was called the Planck satellite. I think it was in 2018, from memory. And it mapped the entire... Uh, universe by by taking a section of it 360 degrees and then 
shifted a bit and it went like that until it went all the way around the sky and it produced a map. You, you could see the map as if though you were inside a basketball, okay? If you were, if you were inside a globe, you would be looking at it like that. But when they stretch it out, it looks like an egg, okay? That's the map of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And there's so much information in that, um, in that um, CMB that they have discerned uh, acoustic shock waves of the Big Bang. They are sort of like rainbow, has intensities of, of different colors. Sometimes you can see three different rainbows, if you're lucky, mostly two. In the same way, they've detected at least two major rings and, and, a, and a slight uh, impression of, of the third one, of what they call baryonic uh, acoustic oscillation, the BYOs. These are the sound waves which would travel in the, in the so-called fluid of the, uh, of the early universe, the, the shock waves. They're also trying to say that because the Big Bang was a vast, violent uh, um, event, there should be some gravitational waves produced by that, just like when two black holes merge and neutron stars and so on, and they produce those gravitational waves. As you will know, we, we have recently detected them since uh, 2015. Now, an experiment by name of BICEP-2 in Antarctica, they, they, they claimed that they have detected them two years ago, but that was discounted because similar kind of results can be produced by cosmic rays and a number of other uh, reactions which happen daily. So that was discounted. So uh, the Big Bang is kind of proven, kind of not, Okay, but something like that must have, have happened to create what we have. And your second question, when did time begin? In our universe, we count our time, time zero, from, from the initial fluctuation, the quantum fluctuation. But in popular literature, it says that it started with the Big Bang. Um, I often wring my hands when I read papers like that. It's, it's totally misleading, but it's easier to understand. Now, the concept of time is, is a subject of another lecture that I have. Time is considered by physicists either unnecessary, non-existent, and it's summarized in the uh, DeWitt uh, um, equation. There's no time. And others consider that time equally goes backwards and forwards. If you can imagine a, a, a rectangular sort of a pipe with a slider in it, the moment that you are aware of right now is the now moment in capitals. And in quantum mechanics, you can shift it back and calculate what it was like before, and you can go forward and calculate what will happen. If you had enough information, you could predict what exactly is going to happen. Now, the only supporting uh, model theory for the existence of time as an independent variable, an in independent entity in physics, is what is known as the arrow of time. We remember the past, but we don't know the future because we have not yet experienced it. Okay? That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. As I know it's a bit esoteric and philosophical, and you might say, ah, that's baloney. Okay? But there's no common sense in quantum physics, so try not to, not to think of it that way. I want you to, to go through a certain uh, thought experiment. Einstein called it Gedanken. Say you have a, a bowl like that, and you put a, a heavy ball, and it immediately sinks to the lowest point, um, and it stays there. A quantum particle doesn't go there. It vibrates and fluctuates all, all over. It jumps all over the place. Okay. Now, that, that ball is your common sense. It's the database of all the experiences which you've acquired through the five senses. Your brain is completely disconnected. 
it interprets what your eye sees, it interprets what you hear. Right now, you are aware of the lights, you hear my voice, you can see me, you are aware of noises in the kitchen. Your brain is processing all of these things in parallel. And then it constructs some kind of meaning out of that. Not in real time, although it appears to you that way. It, 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 it puts them together and it thinks, okay, this is, this is going to make sense as a background to the, to the experience that I have in my database. And it presents you with that. And you say, tick, that makes sense to me. But if it says something like I've just said before, that time is non-existent, you say, that's nonsense, that's not in my experience, and you reject it. Okay? Because all your wisdom is based on sensual experience. Quantum physics is not like that. It deals with, I nearly said reality, <laughs> but I'm sure knowledgeable people would contradict me. <laughs> um, but it deals with, with mathematical concepts that re represent that reality, and very successfully. If I can interrupt yep. So what you're saying is confirming the, the point that for someone to ask the question, what happened before the Big Bang? Uh, what happened before the Big Bang? It's just the wrong question. Now, We've been discussing that for the last 40 minutes, what happened before Big Bang. The fluctuation occurred, the field expanded. But, but in popular literature, you will find ex um, these kind of quotations. To ask what happened before the Big Bang is to ask which way is, is north when you're standing at the North Pole, right? It's, 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 it's totally nonsensical. You can't talk like that because prior to our Big Bang, only nothing comes of nothing. Now, way back in the ancient Greece, Parmenides already said that. Only nothing comes out of nothing, okay? And uh, so when there is something, it must have come from something. Now, all right, you will say to me now, uh, you're just using clever logic here to overcome the problem. Now, there was a famous mathematician by the name of Leibniz, and he established this principle of sufficient reason. If it makes sense to you, if there's enough reason and logic in it, then it must be right. Well, not so in quantum mechanics, I can tell you that. Um, because your background is, is with popular literature, you may have some difficulty accepting this. Yeah. I recommend you read, you read quantum mechanics. <laughs> Any other points? No, I think that's, that's about does the it for time us. Time has expired yet. My brain has expired now. <laughs> <laughs> that was a brilliant talk. Um, a lot of positive comments online as well. Everybody really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I think we might have to get you back later in the year to talk about time. Well, I have a talk ready. <laughs> we'll organi we'll organise it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruno. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, everybody, much. for joining us in here. And, on, and online. And I just wanted to remind everybody that on May 27th we have a public viewing night at Caulfield Racecourse Reserve. There are just over 50 tickets left if you haven't got one. Um, so jump online. Uh, ticket links on the website, on Facebook, and I think it's also on our Instagram account. Uh, and next month, well the next two months are cracking months. Next month we have Alan Duffy presenting for us. Not sure what the topic is yet, he hasn't told me. Um, so come back here for, for next month and watch and listen to Alan uh, talk up a storm. And then following that, we're, at, we're not here, we're at the Athenaeum for our 100th year Astro monthly meeting, which is now Astro Talks. Um, at the Athenaeum, it's the exact day 100 years later from the very first monthly meeting that the AC had. Wow. And we have Sarah Webb coming back to give us another talk uh, which will probably be on the, the, uh, the universe as well. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Fred Watson, uh, we're flying him down from Sydney to come and give us a talk as well. So keep an eye out for the information on those two talks. Um, thank you everybody who donated stars tonight. We greatly appreciate them. And we will see you, I think, on the 20th for a live stream of Gazing at the Galaxies Volume 3. Uh, but for now, it's good night.